Thank you, Lord, for knowing us, for forming us, for making us, for choosing us, for electing us. You've been good to us, God. We just ask now that you bless us in your word as you've blessed us in worship. We thank you for being able to call on your name, to being able, being able to worship you, God, to freely, boldly proclaim, cry out to you, God. We thank you, God, for being on your schedule, God. We thank you, God, because it says, as the Spirit leads us, we'll worship you, God. We're glad to be able to worship you, God. We've come here to worship you, God. There's nothing that we'd rather do than worship your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We adore you, Jesus. We honor you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and praise God. We're continuing in our series, Favor, Favor. So if you'll look now with me, the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, beginning at verse 21. Daniel chapter 2, uh, let's do verse 20. Amen. Amen. Daniel chapter 2, verse 20. Amen. I am your own. Mm. Mm -hmm. Daniel chapter 2, when you have it, say amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Daniel chapter 2, verse 20. When you've got it, amen? Amen. Amen. It reads like this. We'll read quite a few verses. It reads like this. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise the knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made me known to me what was asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exile from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, musician, or musician. Magician, thank you, or the devonier can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in your bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to the thing to come, and the, and the revealer of mystery showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty will know 
may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron and its feet partially of iron and partially baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on threshing floor in summer. And we'll stop right there. Amen and praise God. Do me a favor and just touch a few people around you and say power dynamics. Power dynamics. Power dynamics, amen. Power dynamics, amen. Amen. Hallelujah and praise God. Dynamic. I don't know if you're familiar by okay. or with the Check work out. by Chinua Achibi. It was written in 1958. It's called Things Fall Apart. It literally tells the story a fictional, but a historical fictional story of a Kanoa. A Kanoa was a gentleman who desired to represent his people well. He desired to show what should be done and what shouldn't be done. His people were being colonized and missionaries were coming there to literally take over. And he knew it wasn't best for them. And so he used all of his strength, he used all of his stature, he used all of his might to move his people in the right direction. The big challenge he faced was the, repetition, the reputation of his father. The reputation of his father was one of a waster, a drinker, a debtor, who, someone who didn't work hard or do much. And so he raised his son and he pushed himself with great masculinity, with great force, with great stature to show what kind of man he was and what a man should be. He was very powerful. But in fact, in his efforts to show his power or protect his power or project his power upon his children, his sons, one adopted, something happened. It began to twist him. He would go on to get so angry at his wife that he would beat her nearly to death. In fact, when his son showed signs of weakness, that would anger him either fur even further. He was so uh, determined to show how powerful that he was that he would never allow for a moment of weakness or a moment of kindness or a moment of even cheer. He would go on to kill one of his sons simply to show the kind of man that he was, how tough he was. He would end up being banished from the kingdom. And the story really is this, how we have to be careful with power because power has a way of messing with us power has a way of overtaking us and trying to hold on to power can be very dangerous this is the story in our text because Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful man alive literally he was the one that everybody had to bow to he was the HNIC he had things going in charge he was large and in charge he he, he knew what to do he was was the man that had everything that any man could have. His kingdom was the most powerful, and some could argue, of his time and any time. Nebuchadnezzar was the man. Yeah, I said it right. Nebuchadnezzar was the man, and the only problem with that is no matter what your role is, no matter what your position is, no matter what you have, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you are, you need to understand, and this is what the text teaches us first. I'm going to give you four things that speak to this image and can speak to us. This was uh, an answer to prayer. This image was an answer to prayer in the sense that he got it really as a nightmare. He was trying to figure out what it meant. But Daniel, who was called by God, was enabled by God to tell him what it meant. And in telling him what it meant, he was telling a message to him, but he's also telling a message to us. A message that's better than Puff Daddy's message or a mes message that's be better than uh, any message on power power you could imagine that he teaches right here. And here's the first thing. This is the golden rule that you would need to understand about power. All power comes from God. 
Yeah, yeah. Now, I knew this would happen because that doesn't make you shout if you don't understand its implications. But when you understand its, its implications, then it excites you because you recognize if all power comes from God, then number one, I don't have to fear any power. Yeah, I don't care who you are. I don't care what you think you can do. I don't care where you are. You need to understand that God is really in charge. That it's not the White House. That it's not Barack Obama. And it's not 45. That God at the end of the day is in charge of everything. This is good to know because some of us are tripping and stressing. Because we think we are in charge. We think if we don't hold things together, then things will fall apart. But can I tell you that mentality will cause things to fall apart because you got to recognize early on at the beginning of the day that God holds things together. It was him who held things together back then and it's, th it's him who's holding things together right now and it's him who's holding the future together in the future. So we can be encouraged that God has all power in his hand. But not only that, every now and then if you're honest with yourself, you feel powerless. How am I going to do it? How are we going to make it? How will we pay for this? How will we handle that? How will I raise him? How will I help her? I don't know what I'm going to do. And if you ever feel powerless, I've come by to empower you. Like Daniel said, you've given me power. Okay. You need to know that God invests power in his children. Now, you may not have a title. You may not have a position. You may not drive a Bentley. You may not have a million dollars in a couple accounts, but you do have power. You've been empowered by God to do so much. Now, I don't know the particulars of your empowerment, but I do know God throughout the scripture always empowers his children. I could talk to you about the day of Pentecost. I could talk to you about how he empowered the people of Israel. I could talk to you about how when the people of Israel left uh, slavery, they left with wealth because the, their slave masters literally gave them gold over and over again. You see people who should have been at the bottom, who should have been out who should have been marginalized, who should have been nobodies, and God gave them power. And I want to talk to you because, come on, let me look you in your face. In fact, help me out. Look your neighbor in your face and say, you're powerful. Okay, you didn't say it with enough power. No, look him in the face and tell him, you're powerful. You are powerful. Somebody gave us a bad theology a long time ago, and that is, I'm a nobody. I'm nothing. I'm dirt. I'm manure. I'm nothing. No, God doesn't want you to think that way. He wants you to know that you are in power. You're powerful. I love the poem. We credit Nelson Mandela for it, but it's really by Marianne Williamson. It says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is we are powerful beyond measure. It's our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who who are you not to be? You are a child of God. You're powerful. God wants to do something through you. God wants to empower somebody through you. God wants to teach a lesson to somebody through you. You are powerful. You're going to shake up this world. You're going to shift the dynamics. When you walk in the room, things have to change because you are a child of God. Ooh, well, let me just move on. Now, it's hard for some of us to get that because we think, well, you know, my job title is this, so I'm not powerful. Yeah. Or I live here, so I'm not powerful. Or I I'm in this predicament, so I'm not powerful. Or I'm this age, so I you better get it together and recognize God has called you significant. God has called you powerful. Look at the power dynamics in the text. Nebuchadnezzar is the one going to Daniel. He needs Daniel's help. He said, Daniel, can you help a brother out? You have to understand that even though Nebuchadnezzar had the title, had the position, it was Daniel who was royalty. In fact, the truth is, while I'm preaching, let me just teach it. He literally was royalty because the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 1 that the king Nebuchadnezzar took those who were of the royal lineage. And if you study the history of David, you recognize that David did have a son named Daniel. In fact, David was of, or Daniel was of the lineage of David. 
David. So he was powerful. When he walked in the room, God was on his side. Okay, y'all not feeling me. We're celebrating Martin Luther King. And as we celebrate Martin Luther King, one of my favorite pictures, and there are several, is Martin Luther King sitting in the room with President Johnson. Now look, President Johnson was the president. He was elected. He had all this authority. Military had to follow him and go after him and do what he said do. But do you know who was afraid of who in that room? Uh, yeah, President Johnson was afraid of King. Please, Martin Luther King, can you stop this stuff? Can you stop all this marching? Can you stop all this? Can you, do you know our country is going to fall? Please, Dr. King, you're messing things up. Oh, yes, he was powerful. Don't ever underestimate your power. As a parent, can I talk to you? You're powerful. As a child, can I, as a spouse, can I talk to you? Can I tell you the truth? You know the most powerful person in my life? Yeah, the most powerful person on earth in my life is my wife. Oh, she is. Sometimes I pray. I say, Lord, can you just allow me to sometimes ignore her? Because when she says something to me, literally, when she says something to me, it haunts me. It, I, I mean, she says, honey, I need this and I expect this. I can't get it out of my head. I'll be driving somewhere. I was getting ready to get on the airplane and my wife had told me something and, and gave me some direction and I didn't handle it. I was so baffled or confused. I left my luggage. I didn't have anything in my hand. I got in the plane. They said, you don't have a carry-on? I don't have a carry-on. I don't have a luggage. Because my wife had just corrected me. Amen. All I'm trying to say is you don't realize how powerful you are. Oh, man, I, I got to move on. But that's the gold lesson that power comes from God. And because power comes from God and you are a child of God, you don't have to fear nobody. You don't have to fear the supervisor. You don't have to fear the officer. You don't have to fear anybody. You are a child of God. Do you know who my dad is? Yeah, okay. Uh, first, the lesson that God is trying to teach Nebuchadnezzar and trying to teach all of us is all power. This is the gold lesson. If, if I was Biggie Smalls, this would be my number one lesson. Amen. Amen. Yeah. All power comes from God. But the second lesson is, and I call it the silver lesson, is all power comes with a purpose. Somebody needs to wake up and get this. All power comes with a purpose. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. But I do know you've been endowed. You've been invested with some power. And I want to let you know the reason God has given you that power is particular. It's not incidental. It's not accidental. But God expects you to do something with it. And you don't have to have a title. But if you have a title, you better recognize what that means. God has given you power and you need to use it. You can determine what happens next. It's up to you. There's a purpose on your life. Can I talk to you for a moment? Because I think this text and the story of Daniel is a wonderful picture of what the church is called to do. Can I talk to you? And don't be mad at me, but I'm going to tell the truth. One of the major assignments for any and every Christian church is to prepare the next generation. I'm in the text because keep in mind, do you understand that's what Nebuchadnezzar knew to do? He said, if I'm going to mess up the next generation, the first thing I got to do is mess up their, their faith and I got to get to their children. Can I talk to you, Shiloh? One of the works that God has called Shiloh to do is prepare our children. Get our children for the next, that's the next generation because I can be sanctified. I can be saved and I can be filled with the Holy Ghost. But if I can't get my children to love the Lord, serve the Lord, or follow the Lord, then I will be miserable. Oh, Absalom, oh, Absalom, David cried because he did so much. David did so much. He built so much, but he often failed to handle his children. Come here. Let me talk to you. You don't have to have children to be partially responsible for the community of children because we understand that we are a village. So you understand that all of us are part and parcel of this community and as part and parcel of this community you need to be praying for UC teams. You need to be offering to tutor somebody there. You need to be showing up saying, Minister Johnson, Reverend Johnson, how can I help with the children? When is vacation Bible school? Because I want to make a difference. Don't wait until they're 18, 19, and 20 and then try to fight with them for sagging their pants. Why don't you get to know their name? Man? Get to know their name and get to know who they are. Invest in them. Connect with them. Can I talk to you for a moment? I had one Sunday school teacher who I'll never forget. Yeah. And he taught me a lot but I don't remember all the lessons. I do know that if you got anything right he'd sign you a dollar. Every class he passed out 10, 15 dollars. And I remember I used to love to go to his class as a special ed boy who couldn't read. I would be home at night trying to read the lesson. Uh, 
because I wanted to be in class knowing that lesson. Uh huh, I did. And I learned I could memorize stuff because I couldn't read it, but I could memorize it. Yeah, and I got my dollar bills. Yeah. And all I'm trying to say, that can be you too. You can invest in the next generation. In fact, we're getting ready to take a group of, co- of students to go to a college fair real soon. Do you know you can be on the bus investing in somebody, talking to some young girl, telling her, you know what? You could be the next president. You could be the next one to make a difference. You could turn this thing around. Yes, you can. You are called with a purpose. And don't think that you can let your purpose slide and not be held accountable because all of us will be held accountable for what we do and what we don't do. As a church, we are called to invest in the next generation. Yes, you're saved. Yes, you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes, you know how to step and you know how to talk and you speak in tongues and you're doing it all right. But what about the person behind you? Help somebody by teaching. That's part of our purpose. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Because my hope is my children will not have to suffer from some of the stupid stuff that I suffered from. I talk to my kids about it now. I say, look, son, you can go on the Internet, but be careful because there's some stuff out there. If you start messing with now, you'll be struggling with for a long time. Yeah, brothers, you don't have to say amen. You'll be struggling with for a long time. I know it's tantalizing. I know it's pretty. I know it looks good. But don't get caught up in it. God has something better for you. Let me move on. All, all power has purpose. And you've been empowered. So the question is, what is your purpose right now? What does God want you to do with the power you have right now? I appreciate the emails. I appreciate the text messages. Pastor, we need to do more in this area. Yeah. Pastor, we can do this. Yeah. Pastor, we need somebody to do this. And do you know my new reply for 2019? What are you willing to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to fix that. What check are you willing to write? We need to teach this class. What class are you willing to teach? We need to offer Spanish. Uh, ¿Cómo se llama español? <laughs> I think I said, what, what, I think I said, do you speak Spanish? Yeah, because look, we can do it if we do it. But if you're sitting around waiting for me to do it, yeah, let me move on. Look, there's purpose. Yeah. There's purpose. That's the silver lesson. And look, one of the challenges that we're going to find out about Nebuchadnezzar is he was always impressed. Look, deep door, he was always impressed by God, but he refused to be changed by God. And I'm afraid that too often, even in the church, we have a whole lot of people who are impressed by God, but we're not willing to be changed by God. We're willing to only say, wow, isn't that neat? Wow, your God is powerful. But when are we going to say, he's my God and I'm going to follow him? The silver lesson is all power comes with purpose. Let me give you the broad lesson. And you may not shout in this one here. Yeah, yeah. With power, uh, there's a propensity to be intoxicated. With power, there's a tendency to get beside yourself. Yeah, yeah. It, it was Joe Clark. It was Joe Clark in the movie, and he would like to. He would go around saying that I am the H N I C. Well, eventually, his boss called him into the room and said, "At contrary to popular belief, I am the H N I C." You know, every now and then, my pa- my parents had to do it, my daddy had to do it, my mama had to do it. God has to remind us: No, He's in charge. That you may have the title, you may have the position, they might call you pastor, they might say nice things about you. And I love when people say nice things about me. Oh, I just praise God for our pastor who's a man of God. I start enjoying it. Like, yeah, praise God. Keep on talking. Yeah, yeah. But do you know at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I'm a servant of God that, that just passing through, that I'm going to die, that I, I'm, just a, I'm, I'm, I'm just a servant of God, and all power belongs to God. I work for him. He's my employer. I'm his servant. Yeah, and you got to get that too. That, that, that don't let power make you think that you can do anything. That make you think that you can do everything and not have to answer to God. 
Do you know power really does intoxicate? I heard the story of this leader who was so intoxicated with himself, he didn't consult anybody. Nobody. He didn't consult anybody. In fact, a group of, a, a group of uh, athletes were coming to his house, and he was so powerful, you know, instead of really getting food for him, he thought he'd make a point and order fast food and just make a show of it. And everybody who saw this said, what is wrong with this dude? Didn't somebody tell him that doesn't make any sense? That's what happened when you let power get to your head. You start doing stupid stuff. And by the time right. people tell you, you won't listen. And so you just keep on doing it. Power is intoxicating. Now, some people feel that it's bad to have power. But notice we started off saying that all power comes from God. It is not bad to have power. Power is, in fact, amoral. Amoral. Amoral means it's not good or bad. It's what you do with it. It's like music. It's like a rhythm. It's like a beat in a song. It's amoral. The beat is not sinful. It's the lyrics that you got to watch. Amen, son. So, so look, look, look. And so you got to recognize that the power God has given you has given you for a purpose and be very careful. In fact, the more power you have, the more humble you need to walk. Somebody in your pew is missing this. Tell them, the more power you have... The more, the more humble you need to walk. I praise God for police officers. One of my dear friends was a police officer for, for, in New York for many years. And he used to brag about, as a police officer, he never had to shoot at anyone or anything. In fact, he said, seldom if ever did he have to draw his weapon. In fact, he said, most of the time, I could talk to anybody and get them to reconsider their behavior. And all I'm trying to say that don't let power get to your head. Because if you let power get to your head, the power will kill you. It'll destroy you. It'll take you out. You ought to walk humbly before God. And the more humble you walk, the more God can bless you. That's the, that's the bronze lesson. Let me give you one more lesson and I'll be out your way. And this is the iron and clay lesson. Because that's the last thing of the four major parts of this image that God was using to talk to Nebuchadnezzar. Now I should tell you a little bit about this latter part. Because this latter part speaks to our age. It literally does. It speaks to our age. In Revelation chapter 17, it says that the kingdoms, there will be ten kingdoms before the return. Of Christ. And so those ten toes on the last part, the feet, represent the ten kingdoms. But then there's going to be a great stone, one not cut out with hands, and it's going to strike the image. And that represents God coming, and he's going to have his kingdom or millennial reign. His millennial reign will last for a thousand years, and in that we're going to be part of the leadership. That's what Revelation tells us. Hallelujah. Praise God. But let me go on to tell you what it means to us, because the iron and clay lesson, are you ready? Are you ready? The iron Iron and clay lesson is all power is passing. All power is passing. And this is, ought to give you a sense of urgency because it means that the power that the Lord has vested in you or vested in anyone is temporary and so is momentary. And so it won't always be there. And look, you will not always have the time to pour into your child. You will not always have the time to handle business here at the church. You will not always have the time to prepare the next generation. You will not always have the time to do what you do. So you got to do it right now. That's really part of the message of any apocalyptic writing. Any of the end times writing is really trying to tell us that time is winding up. So you better do what you need to do right now. Don't get so lackadaisical. Don't get so comfortable. Don't think that you have all day to do what you got to do because God says I'm coming back. So you need to do everything you're going to do right now. If that sister that you're dating, don't date her for six and seven, eight, nine, ten years and don't put a ring on her finger. Go ahead and put a ring on her finger because somebody else is going to pass by and say, hey, look, baby, I don't need to interview you for 10 years. I don't need to interview you for five years. Give me five months and I'm going to take, amen. Yeah, whatever the situation is, that child in your home, don't work so many hours that you can't spend time with that child, that you can't laugh with that child, that you can't teach that child. Because one day that child will be off and away in college. When they're talking about nothing to you, about that cartoon, about that video game, listen. Because one day, if you ignore them, they'll say, I've got some important things, but you didn't listen for the unimportant things, so why should I tell you this thing? The work you want to do in the church, do it right now, because God has blessed you to be able to do it. And when you do it, he'll satisfy you, he'll bless you, and he'll bless the church. And that's the important message. Let me move on with this last thought, as I consider this wonderful text in Daniel, because all of us are a little like Daniel. All of us have been called by God to do a great work. All of us have been, been empowered by God, and all of us will be held accountable by God for what we're doing. God says, if you can play 
basketball, teach somebody basketball. God is going to hold us accountable for what we do right now. And when you get to heaven, you can't blame your deacon. You can't blame the preacher. You can't say the preacher never told me to follow Jesus or to serve Jesus. Because he did. Yeah, I'm just making sure. Follow Jesus and serve Jesus. Yeah. You can't ever say that the preacher never told me you were coming back. Because he did. Jesus is coming back. But let me tell you a powerful message in this text. A powerful message in this text. Are you ready? Is that look, we are powerful most through prayer. Yeah, I know I'm in the text because keep in mind, the reason he was standing before the king, because he had prayed to the king of kings. And in praying to the king of kings, the king of kings gave the message for this earthly king. And that's what God wants to do for through you and for you. That when you pray, okay, y'all not feeling me, let me go. One of our members, Dr. Richardson, tell him I said hi when you see him. Dr. Richardson, he actually serves uh, with the UC team school as well. In the military, part of what he did is he was responsible for radioing in bombing uh, directions. And this is really important because even though he had a weapon, a gun on his side, that wasn't what made him powerful. What made him powerful is he carried a radio. And when he carried this radio, he could radio in directions. And if he radio in directions, the Air Force would come and they would drop bombs. Y'all missing this. Let me see if I can make it plain. That's what Daniel did. Daniel could talk to the Air Force. And when he talked to the Air Force, everything on the ground had to change. Come here. Let me talk to you. You may not look like it. You're not driving a tank. You may not have a big weapon or arsenal on you. But you got a radio. And you can call in the Air Force. And when the Air Force comes in, everything on the ground has to change. I don't know what your ground situation is, but if it's dangerous, if the enemy seems to have you surrounded, call in reinforcement and God will step in and he'll send down weapons from heaven and he'll turn everything around. Call in reinforcement and God will move things and, and touch situations. God will move people and lift up people and bring down people and teach people and show people that he's in charge and he, you got a radio don't you? You got a radio in your soul. Call out to heaven. Call out to the highest power and say I need you to move on earth right now. I need you to step in on my job. I need you to step into my, my home. I need you to step in with my children. I need you to step in with my marriage. I need you to step in my church and I need you to move some things around. I need to show the world that I'm connected to a higher power. It's not me but it's thee. But I do know I can call the Father, not 911, but I can call the Son and the Holy Ghost and the Father and things will happen here on earth. I know I'm telling the truth. I'm testifying because I've seen God move in my life through a prayer. I said, God, I need you to heal this person. And I watched God heal him. God, I said, I need you to help my heart. And I saw God heal my heart. God, I need you to touch this situation. And I saw God touch the situation. God, I need you to provide this need. And God provided this need. That's the power of prayer. That's what Daniel did. And that's what made him powerful. I want to let you know, as I take my seat, you're powerful when you fall on your knees. You're powerful when you call on your Father. You're powerful when you trust in the Lord. You're powerful when you walk after Him. And you talk to Him. And you walk with Him. And you call on Him. Like Daniel, even kings will have to say, you know know the Father and He showed you the way. He showed you the Word. He showed you what's happening next. Call on the Father and watch Him change things on earth. He'll do it. Oh yes He will. Oh yes He will. And there's somebody here who can testify. They can say He did this in my situation. They can testify He did this in my home, in my marriage, in my heart, in my hopes. Come on, let's stand to our feet. The gospel has been preached. It, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar is a wonderful example of a person who is in and out, who's off and on, who's fickle in their faith. 